Hello, my name is Joydeep Biswas. I'm an assistant professor in the computer science department. And today I'll be talking about what is artificial intelligence and machine learning. So to dig right in, this is a question which has been uh, raised and uh, answers uh, proposed over the years. And uh, some of the earliest thoughts on this question were uh, from Alan Turing who proposed, can we consider the question, can machines think? Um, and later, including uh, John McCarthy and Nils uh, J. Nilsson, uh, they propose that artificial intelligence is as actually the science and engineering of making intelligent machines, especially intelligent computer programs. Now, what is exactly the nature of intelligence is not was not quite well defined at that time, and it's something which we still grapple with today, and as we shall see uh, shortly. However, if you're looking for a more functional definition, Stuart Russell and Peter Norvig in their textbook on artificial intelligence propose to define AI as the study of agents that receive percepts from the environment and perform actions. Now, if you have to think about uh, AI as, in terms of its applications, we've, we see many applications of AI around us today, including, for example, playing games, driving autonomous vehicles, powering our digital personal assistants, computer vision, robots, the web, and lots of other applications which actually touch us in everyday lives. lives. Now, we can also think about artificial intelligence in terms of some desirable properties that we hope it has. Uh, and these include, for example, ability to perform a task as well as a human, or maybe even better. How uh, ability to uh, adapt to changes in the environment, the ability to reason or operate in circumstances not even seen before, the ability to improve over time with experience. And finally, and this is something which we're really grappling with today, the ability to amplify the best in humans and to minimize the worst in humans. So how did it all begin? I think we all reasonably agree in the field that artificial intelligence really started with what's called the Dartmouth uh, Workshop Proposal, proposed in September 2nd of 1955, and organized by John McCarthy, Marvin Minsky, Nathan Rochester, and Claude Shannon. Uh, they proposed a two-month, 10-man study of artificial intelligence, which is the first time this term was coined, be carried out during the summer of 1956 at Dartmouth College in Hanover, New Hampshire. The study is to proceed on the basis of the conjecture that every aspect of learning or any other feature of intelligence can in principle be so precisely described that a machine can be made to simulate it. And this is a, a, a proposed way of thinking about artificial intelligence. And then they go on that we think that a significant advance can be made in one or more of these problems if a carefully selected group of scientists work on it together for a summer. Now, needless to say, of course, I think at that time, uh, people misunderstood the complexity and the gravity of the problem. So many decades later, we're still trying to solve this problem. But this was a beginning, right? And since then, there have been many milestones, a small selection of which uh, I list over here, starting with Shaky the, first, uh, Shaky the Robot in 1972, and leading up to today, um, when we had AlphaGo and AI Agent defeating Lee Seidel at Go. And I'll talk through some of these, uh, these milestones as examples of what does AI and ML really encompass. So going right to the beginning of this idea that AI can power robots, here's a very simple idea of what a robot does. A robot, in a nutshell, senses things what's going on in the world. It decides what to do by basic, based on planning and then it acts, and then the world is uh, evolved, and then it uh, recenses it, and it plans again, and just this loop uh, goes over and over again. So the core part of this, uh, this idea here is the planning block in the middle. Now, what is exactly planning? In a nutshell, here's what we can think about planning. If we are given an initial state of the world and a set of available actions, the requirements of those actions, and the outcomes or the effects of these actions, we should be able to come up with a, a sequence of actions that start from the initial state and terminate at the goal state, right? Now, this idea um, has been used to great effect uh, on uh, Shaky the robot and many other robots since. I will play for you now a video of this robot actually planning in this world. First, Shaky plans to use the action go to D5 that will take him to the doorway. Then he will use the actions go through D5 
and go to D3. Finally, he plans to use go through D3 and block D4 with box 1. After computing the plan, Shaky begins to execute it. So this was an example of one of the earliest examples of planning actually working in the real world with the robot uh, performing actions to, uh, to actually complete tasks given to it. Now, let's come back to this, uh, this nature of uh, what is intelligence. So was that robot really intelligent? Well, here's uh, something which humans have been thinking for a long time. Maybe playing chess is a mark of intelligence. The more intelligent a human, the better they are at playing chess. So driven by this idea of intelligence being marked by how well an agent can play this really hard, seemingly hard game, some of this early uh, um, attempts at solving artificial intelligence uh, was uh, geared towards trying to see if you could get computers uh, to play chess via planning that we saw before. So how do we apply planning to this problem of playing chess? Okay, so this is what we can do. So initial state of the world is the chess board uh, state at every state at each turn. Now the set of available actions their requirements and their effects are essentially the chess moves, how these pieces move in the world. And the goal state is to actually have some checkmate conditions, right? And then the plan essentially consists of a sequence of chess moves. So this is an abstract how you would apply the planning problem to chess, but how do you actually solve it? One way to solve this problem is using an algorithm which we call tree search. And in tree search, we essentially use th uh, four steps, and these four steps proceed as follows. First, the computer valid, uh, enumerates all valid moves available to it, right? Next, if it were to take each of those actions or each of those moves, it will enumerate all valid moves for each of those outcomes available to the opponent. And it keeps repeating these two steps until the game ends, and then it can actually pick the action at the current time step, which led to the most number of wins down the, uh, down the line. Now, the problem is that if you just do this, uh, just steps doing, uh, doing steps one and two until the very end of the game is infeasible because they will enumerate more states than is computationally tractable to reason about. So we make a small modification, and what we do is that we say that this computer is only going to do this up to some number of steps ahead, right? And then if the game does not end within those number of steps, all it's going to do is it's going to apply a score to the state of the chessboard to ascribe it, how good is it for the computer, okay? And it turns out that this idea, this simple uh, tree search idea, plus some clever uh, uh, algorithms to like strategies to speed up the search is sufficient, was sufficient to actually help a computer beat the human champion at chess, Gary Kasparov. And this particular computer, Deep Blue, had one secret sauce, which is that it had a large number of specialized chips which were designed specifically to evaluate chess moves, and that really gave it a competitive advantage, right? And then we suddenly had a computer, a seemingly autonomous, uh, artificially intelligent being, being able to uh, defeat the world uh, champion in chess, right? Now, we posited that, that how well you can play chess is a mark of intelligence. With computers actually able to beat the human world chess champion, would we consider AI solved? If I have to ask this question, the answer is no. And really, there are several reasons as to why. Uh, so first of all, trivially, there are actually games that are harder than chess, where the strategies which we use for chess uh, over here, um, we cannot actually do them, right? And the second thing is that the, the strategy chosen by this computer to have these specially designed computer chips does not really scale very well to general problems. But deeper than that, there's actually this uh, this in interesting insight that Hans Moravec uh, provided, which is that it is actually comparatively easy to make computers exhibit adult level performance on intelligent chess uh, tests or playing checkers and difficult or impossible to give them the skills of a one-year-old when it comes to perception and mobility, right? And this is an idea which, uh, which again, um, uh, was, was picked up uh, by Rodney Brooks in this uh, really seminal paper called Elephants Don't Play Chess. And he argues in this paper that at the time, a lot of the efforts of the research community was going towards 
creating these programs which could do things like play well at chess, and it was excluding all of these other things which would uh, help robots do perception and mobility. And Rodney Brooks really argues that elephants are also intelligent, but they can't play chess. That, does, that, that should provide you an insight that, you know, we shouldn't be ruling out approaches which are not good at playing chess. Okay, so to come back to the problem of perception and mobility, I want to talk a little bit about how can we actually solve reason about these problems of perception and mobility. All right, so imagine that you have an autonomous vehicle, uh, which I've drawn a figure of over here, and you're asking this autonomous vehicle to drive forward two meters. It turns out that real, uh, uh, real beings in the real world have errors. So you ask it to drive forward two meter, it'll, it won't drive forward exactly two meters and there'll be some errors in its orientation. And if you do this a large number of times, you'll see actually some distribution of the kinds of errors that this vehicle actually exhibits. Now here are some questions that we might raise. What are these types of errors that this vehicle is, is exhibiting? And can we somehow predict or hypothesize these possible outcomes of this vehicle? And the answer is that yes, we can. We actually do have some good tools, mathematical tools to reason about these questions. And for, foremost of these uh, tools is what we call a model, a probabilistic model. In this particular case, it's a motion model, which provides a limited approximation of the expected outcomes of this robot's motion, as well as the distribution of errors it could make. Now, the key thing to note over here is that it's a limited approximation. It doesn't capture all of the different uh, things that could possibly go wrong. It captures many of the most commonly observed uh, sources of errors of this, uh, of this vehicle, which, which is uh, succinctly captured by this adage which says that all models are wrong, but some are actually useful. And how are they useful? They're useful in, in uh, this method of artificial intelligence, uh, which we call probabilistic methods. And the key idea of these probabilistic methods is instead of thinking about the exact true state of the world, can you instead reason about the probable distributions given the noisy sensor data that you have and this imprecise actuation in the world, right? And this key idea of probabilistic methods turned out to be very successful. In fact, around 2004, DARPA believed that uh, it could actually jolt the research community into really pushing these algorithms to actually have autonomous vehicles back then. So it actually posited this challenge uh, called the DARPA Grand Challenge to build an autonomous vehicle to navigate 150 miles in the Mojave Desert alongside I-15. Now, the initial competitors included 21 teams uh, from universities and companies across the country. Uh, and the preliminary test was to drive these vehicles along a one mile obstacle course. Um, some of these teams were not able to do that and uh, they were left with 15 teams uh, which were the final competitors. But unfortunately, it turns out this was a quite a hard problem. No team actually completed the course. In fact, the team that went the farthest, the red team from Carnegie Mellon, got farthest 7.4 miles before driving off course. But DARPA did not give up. It reproposed the same grand challenge the next year in 2005. And there the course included off-road parts uh, and dirt parts, which are, for example, shown in the, uh, in the photograph on the left over here. And the outcomes were quite a stark contrast to the previous year. Uh, 22 teams actually completed the course and uh, Stanley, which was from the Stanford racing team, actually won and completed this course, uh, which was over 132 miles, uh, completing it in six hours and 54 minutes. So, so at this point, uh, people were actually uh, quite excited to see these probabilistic methods and symbolic reasoning as well work in the real world. Um, and to push the, the state of research even further, DARPA posted the Urban Challenge in 2007, which was essentially to build an autonomous vehicle uh, to navigate 60 miles on an urban course to be completed in less than six hours, obeying all the traffic regulations from the California state driving laws, while negotiating with real life traffic and obstacles. And there were 11 teams that competed in this challenge. Six teams actually completed the course and the winning team, Tartan Racing from Carnegie Mellon, uh, averaged 14 miles per hour uh, in this course. And of course, uh, uh, this really spurred the development of autonom autonomous vehicles. Nowadays, you, uh, I'm sure you're, you're aware of many companies which are trying to build autonomous vehicles to actually work in the real world, right? So 
if I had to review what I've covered so far, and what I've covered so far is canonically called classical artificial intelligence. And the idea there is that if you could formulate the problem mathematically, including probabilistic models, and provide reasonably accurate models for them, and if you have sufficient compute power, you could actually get quite far, right? But there are certain limitations of classical AI, right? Now, the problems of classical AI is that sometimes an AI problem is actually hard to state as a precise mathematical equation. An example of such a problem is, for example, detecting a cat in an image, right? We don't have mathematical equations which represent a cat, right? Other times, even when we can precisely state the mathematical equation, these AI problems can be so hard, they can be so computationally hard to evaluate that we can't actually do them with uh, precisely and exactly with computers, right? For example, in the game of Go, computing the probability of winning exactly uh, is actually uh, uh, it, it, quite intractable to do in real time, right? So how do we solve these problems? All right, so I'm going to uh, guide us towards the uh, way of thinking about this AI problem, which led to the birth of machine learning, right? So the way we do this is that, what if we think of AI as a function approximation problem, and this function that we're trying to build F is the one which is going to solve the problem that we have at hand. Take, for example, the problem of detecting a cat in these images, right? Uh, one way to think about this is that you can give it example images, and when you feed it a photograph of a cat, um, this function should output, yes, there's a cat in the image. And if you give it a photograph with no cats in the image, it will say, not cat, right? So the really, the question is, how can we represent this unknown function f, and can we somehow learn this function, right? And this is really what machine learning is after, right? And there are many different ways of learning these unknown functions. But recently, what's really uh, become very popular and very successful at solving these kind of problems are artificial neural networks. And I want to talk a little bit about how these things work, right? So I want to talk about uh, very briefly how we can uh, build these artificial neural networks to solve real problems. So at the lowest level, this is what's going on. So supposing you have three input numbers, in one, in two, and in three, if you multiply them by three uh, numbers, which are gonna be called weights, and these weights are gonna be very important shortly, right? And let's say you add up the result of those inputs times the weights, and you pass them through a nonlinear function, you will get some output, right? Now this property, this, this, uh, this computation that you do, is essentially what we call an artificial neuron, right? A single neuron actually cannot do that much, but what you can do is you can build up a complex network of a very large number of these neurons, right? And all of these neurons together can be thought of essentially as approximating your function f that you're after. And, in, and to really drive home the point, what we're trying to do here is those input numbers are essentially the pixel representations of the cat or the image that we have, right? And the output, if the output number is zero, we interpret that as to, uh, to mean that there is a cat in the image, and if the output is one, we say that there's no cat in the image, right? So how do we actually learn this function f? Remember the weights that I spoke about for a single neuron a, a, a moment ago? We're gonna go back to those. In particular, we're gonna play this game where we ask this question, if we increase the first weight of the neuron n1, will it make the overall output of this entire network closer to zero or one for this input, right? And this input, as you can see over here, is actually a cat. So we want it to go to zero. So accordingly, we want to increase or decrease the weight depending on whether it gets it closer to zero or one. And we play this game again for the second weight and we ask the same question and adjust it. We do this again for the second neuron. And we keep doing this for all of the weights for all of the neurons to get the output closer to zero for this input because zero implies cat and the input image over here is indeed a cat, right? So you repeat this for another uh, known image of a cat, another image which we know uh, depicts a cat, right? And we can do this again for images which don't have cats in them, but now we're gonna try to get the output of the function to be closer to one, and one in, in, implies that there is no cat in the image. If you do this for many, many, many rounds of updating the weights, 
the function f represented by this neural network actually starts to behave approximately correctly. Right? And this, this seemingly simple idea actually turned out to be uh, quite br uh, uh, revolutionary. Around 2012, um, what happened is that uh, this particular paper um, proposed a complex neural network, which now which, which became called AlexNet, to actually solve a visual recognition challenge, uh, which was the ImageNet large-scale visual recognition challenge. And in this challenge, there were a large number of images, some of which are shown in the slide here. And this machine learning algorithm had to tell what in the image uh, was there and classify it according to one out of a thousand categories. And these categories are actually quite hard. It's actually quite hard even as humans to uh, understand what's in these images. Take for example, uh, this image on the top left over here. The answer to that is that it's a mite in the image. You can't just say it's some insect. It needs to be very specifically a mite, right? It turns out that the previous approaches before these uh, large neural networks had, a, had an error rate of approximately 25%. And AlexNet really dropped the error rate significantly. It really pushed the bar um, to about 16%. And this is when everybody stood up and realized, wow, these neural networks are actually performing uh, really difficult tasks and they're doing really well in them. Can we do other things with them? What else can these neural networks do beyond just image recognition? Right? So forward, uh, fast forward to around 2016, um, AlphaGo, which is a computer program, actually defeated Lee Seidel at this game of Go, right? And how did it do that, right? So recall, we said that if you're trying to do planning via tree search, we saw that uh, Go is a game which is hard enough that you can't actually do it with just the algorithm that we said, right? So how did AlphaGo actually do this, right? I'm going to play a, a video clip which explains the insight behind what's going on. There's the policy network, which was trained on high-level games to imitate those players. And then we have a second component, we call this the value net. And it can evaluate the board position and say, what is the probability of winning in this particular position? And then third component is the tree search, where it would look through different variations of the game and try to figure out what will happen in the future. So if we now take a position like this, first the policy network would scan the position and come up with what would be the interesting spots to play. And it builds up a tree of variations and it then employs this value net that tells it how promising is the outcome of this particular variation. So AlphaGo tries to maximize its probability of winning but it doesn't care at all about the margin by which it wins. Now, if you actually uh, see what's happening in the video, interestingly, it takes the idea of this tree search that we had seen before, and it makes a couple of modification. Instead of evaluating all the moves available to the computer, it actually evaluates promising moves from a policy neural network, right? And then it does that for the opponent as well. And it keeps doing this up to some number of steps ahead, just like it did in chess, that, as we saw in chess before. But then it uses a learned neural network again to actually decide whether the outcome is actually going to be a good state of the world, a, a desirable state of the world or not. And it turns out that machine learning plus this, uh, this classical idea of tree search was actually able to solve this seemingly very, very hard problem of actually beating the world champion at, at Go, right? And there was, a, there was a big fallout after this and people started questioning, uh, well, is this it? Is artificial intelligence uh, uh, gonna defeat all humans for all possible games and all possible tasks? There is a very interesting uh, a clip in the video on uh, AlphaGo the movie, which I wanna share, because it really brings about um, something which, is, uh, which I believe in in the philosophy of artificial intelligence as well. Of course, it's natural that humans want humans to win. I mean, I think that's a natural response. But AlphaGo is human created, and I think that's the ultimate sign of human ingenuity and cleverness. Everything that AlphaGo does, it does because a human has either created the data that it learns from, created the learning algorithm that learns from that data, created the search algorithm. All of these things 
have come from, from humans. So really, this is a human endeavor. <laughs> the point that, that this video clip makes is uh, David Silver uh, points out that while this is a game of computer versus human and it is natural for humans to be rooting for humans, I mean, the main point is that the algorithms that are running are still created by humans. So in some sense, it is still a human endeavor and it is a testament to what humans can achieve uh, if they actually put their minds to it. Now, the fallout of this uh, led to many open questions, which is, for example, is human versus AI in board game a useful yardstick for measuring intelligence anymore? Can these AI systems actually learn to solve more than one specific problem at a time? Can these agents be actually taught to have intrinsic motivation instead of being told this is a game you should play, right? And finally, can we actually interpret, predict, or guarantee the output of these AI systems? I will mention that these are all questions which are actively being uh, sought to be answered in, uh, in the machine learning and artificial intelligence community, right? Now, the thing is that today, um, AI and machine learning is rapidly being deployed to tackle problems that materially impact human lives via healthcare, finance, law enforcement, and education. Since it is actually being used in these applications, it is important to be cognizant about the possible ways in which things could go wrong, right? And we're, we're, we're trying to grapple with these questions including, for example, what if the models, and we spoke about probabilistic models earlier, what if the models are wrong? What if these algorithm assumptions, and every algorithm makes some assumptions, what if these assumptions are wrong? What if the system does not work with inputs from different sources? You've trained it with, with uh, some examples from some place, and in other place, will they work equally well there? What if the data is biased or incomplete or malicious, right? So these questions of what can, how can we guarantee that our algorithms are gonna be safe despite all of these things is really an open, open challenge, right? But really what's required today, and we're starting to uh, see a lot of momentum over here, is, um, is starting to reason about a code of ethics for AI practitioners. And really this, this tries to come back to this, this final point which I had spoken about as a desirable property of AI. Um, is the AI system equipped to amplify the best in humans and to minimize the worst in humans? Now to do that, I mean, the kind of questions that we really need to be asking are, first of all, is AI even the correct solution to the problem? Is the AI system ready to meet the real world? Where is the data coming from? How could it possibly be misused? These are the kinds of things which we actually should be asking ourselves before we try to push AI and machine learning out into the real world. But coming back to just an overview of AI and machine learning, I want to point out that I chose these, uh, these milestones um, that we covered uh, today to actually cover essentially three major waves of AI research that have happened, including symbolic planning, probabilistic reasoning, and neural networks, and the thing is that while we are currently in the third wave, which is neural networks, and that's really extremely popular, AI is not just one thing. It requires advancement on all three areas, despite the fact that one of them is more popular today, right? And uh, that's something to, uh, to remember and keep in mind because every system deployed in the real world really builds on what we have learned from all these three, uh, three uh, areas. With that, I will conclude for today, and I'm happy to take questions.